Well, if we will, if, uh, if one of our nursery workers would uh, grab up some of these youngins and go in the back so these young couples can stay in here and hear the word, uh, we'd appreciate that. All right. Well, turn with me to Matthew in chapter 13 today. Matthew in chapter 13. We'll be in verses 1 through 8 this morning. Matthew chapter 13, verse 1. When you find Matthew 13 and you find verse 1, those that are able, if you'll stand with me to the reverence of reading God's holy, infallible, His preserved word that we hold in our hands. Verse 1 of Matthew 13, The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered together unto Him, so that He went into a ship and sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore. Verse 3, And he spoke many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. Verse 4, And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprang up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they were withered away. Verse 7, And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell unto the good ground, and brought forth fruit, 
some in hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I, I come to you, Lord, and feel the weight of responsibility this morning, Lord. Uh, God, I pray in the name of Jesus, keep me yielded to thy word, keep me yielded to thy spirit. And Father, in the name of Jesus, help me to proclaim thy word, Lord, thy truth, thy gospel. God, may you move in a mighty way this morning, Lord. We've been praying, Lord, for souls to be saved, lives to be changed. We believe, God, that you're the only avenue and access that man has for change and transformation. And God, may you do your great work of enlightenment this morning. It's in Jesus Christ's holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Well, we come this morning and we look at Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 8, a very familiar passage. And man, I tell you, I love Matthew 13, and I like this parable. And I'm telling you, we could do 15 sermons out of this right here. But this morning, God has taken me here, and he's given me something different this morning that is allocated just to us this morning as a congregation. We remember in Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 8, we'll look at that in just a minute. But this morning, I want to speak on this subject, investing and receiving. Investing and receiving. Uh, now, many of y'all saw dollar signs when I said investing and receiving. We're not necessarily talking about dollar signs this morning as much as we are investing to the kingdom of God and receiving a return in His work this morning. Uh, this morning, if there's a main idea for you to get, I would say it would be this. You will not receive a harvest where you have not invested. You will not receive a harvest where you have not invested. Uh, I want to tell you today, there's a lot of congregations this morning that have gathered together and they haven't invested anything into what they're wanting to receive a harvest. Many are saying, Lord, give us a harvest of souls. Help us to, may somebody get saved as if fairy dust is going to fall out the sky and somebody just magically get saved. Uh, but friend, I want you to understand that we are rewarded according to our investment. And just as in the business world, or let's say in the retirement war world, some of y'all would have maybe 401ks or 457s or investment plans or retirement plans. And you know what? Probably nobody's going to just give you a million dollars at retirement. Uh, now, maybe, maybe it might work out for some, but I would, would say probably if you hadn't invested, you're not going to get a return, are you? Well, did you know that the way the Lord's work is is very much the same way? If we don't invest our lives, we're probably not going to see a return. And this morning we want to look at this investing and receiving out of Matthew chapter 13. Uh, what's going on in this uh, parable, a parable is a short sto story. Some have said that a parable was an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. What Jesus was doing nonetheless by telling a parable here is that he's walking with the common man. Uh, is anybody in here rich, a lawyer, or some big hotshot politician today? I don't think we've got none. Most of us, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I don't want to offend anybody. Most of us is rednecks here this morning, okay? And uh, that's just the way we are. And uh, this morning, we need a little bit of help. We can't talk on a high language, so we need, we need the, the, the dumbed-down version, or the, let's say it like this, the plow man's version. How about that? So what Jesus was doing, he knew that he was talking to a, a context of common people. And what he was doing, he was using stories that they could understand to help them to understand the gospel. And here he gives a story and he talks about a sower. And uh, this sower was, we could say, a farmer. And he's got a bag of seed. And what he's doing is he's going through the fields and he's throwing out seed. So the, the farmer is coming through and he's sowing seed. Now, some of y'all don't even know what that there means. Half of you don't even know how to, what a John Deere tractor is, and you don't even know how to crank an old-timey God bless farm all. Say amen right there, that 140. Uh, but uh, most of y'all would, would need to understand that when you've got a field there and a piece of ground, you've got to come through, and you've got to come with tractors and blades, and, and you've got to disc that up and soften the dirt and uh, get rid of the weeds and get rid of all of the chafe and all of the stuff that's out there. And then you can come with seed and the dirt soft and you plant the seed in it and then the seed comes up. And then you got to do a lot more with the crop. But here what's pictured is a farmer who's coming through, someone who is investing, someone who is concerned uh, with producing a crop. And he's got a seed and he's throwing seed and he's throwing it out on different types of ground. There's four tip different types of ground that this seed is falling on. First of all, he said in verse 4, he said that there was the seed that fell by the wayside in verse 4. The wayside was hard-packed dirt. It was kind of like this asphalt parking lot out here. That's the wayside. That seed, you can throw anything on top of it. It's going to set on top of it, but it's not going to, it's not going to penetrate to the soil. 
So you could probably drop you a seed out there. It might sprout a little bit, but it's going to die because it's a hard way. Uh, many of y'all have four-wheeler paths or, or dirt paths or around your farm where you drive, and it's hard packed, isn't it? So if you throw seed in the field and you've got a hard roadway right there, that seed that gets on the good ground is going to produce, but the one that falls on that hard driveway, it's not going to produce. The ground's too hard. Uh, that is a picture of someone uh, that has a hard heart. You see, uh, we look and we see there was a second type of soil, and we would see that in verse 5, and it was stony soil. And what was the picture was in Israel, there is a, a lot of soil, there is a lot of rock and a very little soil in some places. Some places there's solid rock an inch under the topsoil. So you may have an inch full of topsoil, but then there's solid rock under it. So sometimes seed is thrown on that shallow soil and it comes up quick, but it doesn't have enough dirt and water to sustain it. So that seed dies because there's solid rock under it. Then we would see a different, another type of soil where this sower was sowing. And he got through the good ground and he had the hard ground over here, seed fell on it. But then he got down towards the end of the field. You know, the long end of the field, right? Where there's trees and there's woods. And some of that got thrown out there in the woods. And when he casted it out with his hand, it got out there in the big brush. And what happened is that seed tried to come up, but the thorns and the thistles choked it out. It couldn't grow. But then there was a fourth type of soil as this sower was sowing in this parable, and it was called the good ground. And what happened with the good ground? It fell into soft, toiled, fertilized soil, and it produced, it produced mightily uh, in, uh, we could even see uh, verse 23, look at there. But verse 23 says, but he that receives seed in the good ground, he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit. How much is it going to bear forth? It bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. Are y'all with me? I'm trying to get through the context of this thing so we can start preaching here. What we see here is that in verses 1 through 8, Jesus gives the parable. And the disciples say, Jesus, you're talking in parables. Why don't you just speak completely plain to us? Jesus said, because some of y'all need to know the truth, but some of you don't need to know the truth. Because some of you is going to manipulate and misuse the truth. You remember Jesus had some people that would hear the seed and follow him and hear the word, said, I believe in you, Jesus. But then there were other people, those Pharisees and scribes that would hear the word and they'd get the truth and what would they do? They'd try to turn it around on the preacher Jesus and say, well, you said this. Well, this ain't true. What about Moses? What about law? What about this? So Jesus was given the parables to reveal truth to those who would believe, but also to conceal truth from those who did not want to believe. Do you know today there's people that want to believe the gospel and there's people that just don't, flat out don't want to hear the gospel, don't care. No matter how good a presentation you give, they're not going to receive it because they're not there to receive it. We well, hear in verses 1 through 8, Jesus gives the parable. The disciples ask, why did you do this? Why did you give it in a parable? Tell us the plain truth. And then in verses, uh, uh, roughly uh, verses 18 through 23, Jesus talks to his disciples and he says, okay, hear the truth of the parable. The sower that went forth is the children of God. It's the men of God that's throwing forth the seed of the gospel. What is the seed? The seed is the gospel itself. So that seed, this is a, a person of God who is going through and they're throwing out seed of the gospel. They're telling the truth. Well, what's the soils? What kind of crop are we talking about? That's the hearts of men. That's the hearts of men. You see, this morning, possibly in this place, there could be four types of hearts here this morning. There are some that are so hard, you'll just, you just came because you was made to come, or you came because you felt obligated to come, or you came because you just, that's what you do. Or maybe there's some people that would even come for a status position or something in the church, and that's why they came, and their heart is so hard, they've never been saved. And they don't even want to hear the gospel. And that seed will fall on that heart. By the wayside, you know what happened? The birds are coming, scoop up the seed and eat it for food. And that's what happens in some people's hearts. They won't receive the gospel and it's swooped up quickly. The second type of soil uh, that we saw there, it was, uh, it was uh, shallow soil. That one with just a little bit of soil and then there was solid rock under it. And that was someone who received the, the, the gospel quickly. The Bible says Annan with joy. They received it, and uh, it sprouted up just a little bit, but then because of persecution for the gospel's sake, it withered and was scorched and died. 
You see, there's some people that come and they receive the gospel. They hear it and they say, oh yeah, it sounds good to me. I'll take the gospel. I want to go to heaven. Now, they didn't really receive salvation, but what they did, they responded positively to the gospel and said, oh, I'll take it. Yeah, if that'll get me my ticket to heaven, I'll take it. But it's shallow soil. And then because they figure out, hey, you mean I got to be faithful to church? I'm going to be faithful to God in prayer and I'm, I'm going to witness to people and, hey, Lord, I'm not going to be cool. I can't hang out and do what I used to do now that I'm saved and transformed and changed. No, that's no good. They, they're withered and the seed dies because of the shallowness. But then there was those, the third type of soil, the third type of heart. Now what happened? The seed of the gospel fell on it and then the toils, the, the weeds and the briars took it over. That's the concerns of the world as it explains in verses 18 through 23. There's a lot of people that really want to be saved and are responsive to the gospel or positive, give positive responses to it, but they don't want to give up their worldly activities for the gospel. The world, the briars come up and choke out the seed of the gospel. Why? Because they'd rather hang with the boys. They'd rather have a wild life. They'd rather, they'd rather have a life that is not attaining to the things of God. So the world chokes out the seed of the gospel. And that's what happens to the majority. But thank God for the good ground. And there's that soil and there's hearts here this morning that have received the seed of the gospel and it has produced and it's bringing forth fruit. And there are those here this morning that your soul is ready for salvation. You've been plowed. You've been through life. The Holy Spirit of God has dealt with you. Your heart is soft this morning. You say, bless God. I don't care if, it, I don't care if it's persecution. I don't care about the world anymore. I don't care about hardness of heart. God, give me the gospel so I can produce for you. I need salvation. That's, that's a good heart. And perhaps there's some here, there's many here that have received and are producing fruit. There's some here that your ground's ready just for the seed so you could just receive salvation and begin to produce fruit. Here this morning, I, I don't, uh, I'm, I'm trying to move quickly. There's so much to talk about. Could y'all give me five hours? Well, we've got to dial in on just what we've got this morning, talking about investing and receiving. I want to talk about the sower, not necessarily the seed, and not necessarily the hearts that are receiving seed. This morning, I want to talk about those who have been born again, those who have been saved by the blood of Jesus, uh, those who have trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, and they've been transformed into a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit of God, those who have received seed unto their heart, the good ground, and it is beginning to produce. Now I'm talking to saved people right now for a few minutes and what I'm telling you here is I want you to look at verse 3. It says in verse 3 and he spake many things unto them in the parable saying behold a sower went forth to sow. A sower went forth to sow. First of all if you're going to be a sower of the gospel you've got to be a believer of the gospel. You've got to be saved by the blood of Jesus. You've got to be a believer before you can bring other people unto Jesus to be believers. Say amen right there. Church membership is not just people who want to be, who want to be a member. Church membership is people who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ and saved. Then they become a member of the local New Testament church. We look and we see here, when, as we look at this sower, I want to give you one point today with many subpoints, and that's this. Your harvest is dependent upon your investment. As a believer, your harvest is dependent upon your investment to the kingdom work of God. We look and we see, first of all, that you will only harvest the seed you have sown. This sower that went forth, he's throwing seed. That's a picture of you and me going out forth today as believers. We're going into the world. We're going into the field of the Lord. We're casting out seed. It's falling upon different types of heart, but we're looking for that good ground, ain't we? That tells us, first of all, that the percentage of us leading someone to salvation is smaller than people who will reject salvation. I say it again. The percentage of people who will receive salvation is way less than those who will reject salvation. We see four types of soil here. There's three that reject the gospel seed of Christ. There's only one that receives it. Next, uh, in the world, you've got all of these four types of soil but predominantly, you're going to find those three types that reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can I tell you that most of the world is going to a devil's hell because they will not receive the gospel of Christ. Why? Because their heart is more worried about themselves rather than submitting and yielding to God. That's the sad fact of it, but we're looking for good seed. Aren't you glad there's good seed out there? Look around you this morning. There's a lot of good hearts been saved by the blood of Jesus. 
You will, only invest, you will only harvest the seed you have sown. This is a principle in Scripture. I'll read to you Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 through 9. You will only harvest the seed you have sown. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever grab it, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Verse 8, For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing. What's the picture here? The picture is, is that the law of reaping and sowing is that you reap what you sow. Now, as one preacher said, I can't remember who said it. They all copy each other a lot of times and they say the same illustrations. But uh, this wasn't natural to my mind. Uh, but one preacher said what we do most time is people, we plant and plant and plant. And then we pray for crop failure. You want to get insurance and hope that crop doesn't come up, don't you? And that, that's the way I am. When we sow to the flesh, when we sow to wickedness, we've all had our time in sin. Hey, I've had my time in sin. You've had your time in sin. And we have sowed to the, to the flesh rather than the spirit. So what we see here in that the law, uh, with, uh, the law of sowing and reaping in the Bible is that you get what you sow. Now, some of y'all, uh, there's weeds coming up in the yard, isn't there? Can't get rid of them things. You can spray them. They, want, they keep coming right back up, don't they? Why is that? It's because at some point in time, that seed fell into that ground and it still continued to pop up. Why? Because somebody sowed weed to it or maybe perhaps it was fell off your lawnmower or taken there from another yard and it got there and now it's beginning to populate. And it's the same way. When we sow to sinful things in our life, we're going to reap sinful things and bad things. And most of us begin, we sow a lot of sin early in life. And then later in life, it begins to produce. And we say, God, why'd you do this to me? Why are you allowing this to happen to me? No, God didn't. God, God allowed you to plant the seeds you wanted to plant. Now that it's coming, back, coming up, you're beginning to see what sin and self and the devil, Satan, will do for your life. He'll promise you the world, but he'll give you a bag of, of weed seed to plant in your field. And when the weeds come up, it ain't too good, is it? Here's the thing about the law of sowing, uh, reaping and sowing. First of all, you're going to reap what you sowed. You don't sow to the evil and produce spirit, spiritual things. And you don't sow spiritual things and reap evil things. So you will only harvest the seed that you have sown in your life, in your work, in your family. Where you're sowing the spirit, spiritual seed of the gospel is going to produce and it's going to come up. Here's this, another law of uh, reaping and sowing. Not only do you reap what you sowed, but you also, you reap more than what you sowed. You reap more than what you sowed. Now, what's the favorite vegetable in here today? Would it be cucumbers or would it be squash? It had to be fried squash. Praise God right there. I felt, I felt the Holy Ghost on that one. You plant a squash seed in your garden here shortly, what's going to come up? There's going to come up a squash bush off of that one seed. And you know what's going to happen? It's going to bring a multitude of squash on that bush. You're going to reap more than what you sowed. You sow a little bit of uh, wickedness, you're going to reap a whole lot more than what you sowed. And you, reap to the, you sow to the Spirit, you're going to reap a lot more than what you sowed. That's the law of, of reaping and sowing. Now we're talking about your harvest is dependent upon your investment. As sowers, this sower went forth to sow. You will only harvest the seed that you have sown. Secondly, you will only harvest the amount you have sown. You will only harvest the amount of seed that you have sown. Let me read you an idea in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 and verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 6 says this, But this I say, He which soweth sparingly, who soweth a little bit, shall reap also a little bit, sparingly. But he which soweth bountifully will reap bountifully. So what are we seeing here? That as a church and a congregation and even as individuals, you're going you're gonna, to uh, harvest on the amount that you have sown. So if you throw a lot of gospel seed out there, you're going to reap and have a bigger harvest. <coughs> but here's the other thing. If you just sow a little bit, when it's easy, you're just going to reap a little bit. I'm afraid that many of us as the church and local congregations are not planting much seed. We're not investing much, but we're looking for a great harvest. Jesus said the, har the, the, the fields are white with harvest, but the laborers are few. That's true. 
Because all of us as believers aren't investing in the kingdom of God and the kingdom work of God, are we? But we're, in, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're not investing, but we're hoping somebody's going to drop a million in spiritual benefits out of the sky for us. We've got to be investors, investing and receiving. You only harvest the amount you have sown. In 2 Corinthians 9, we've read verse 6. Let's read verse 7. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. You're only going to harvest the seed you have sown. You will only harvest the amount you have sown. Thirdly, I think when we see this sower in Matthew chapter 13 and him going forth and him casting the gospel seed forth, something that we learn from him is you are expected to sow according to your ability. You are only expected to sow according to your ability. Uh, I, would, I won't turn there. I want, to, uh, I want to keep time as low as possible for you this morning. Uh, there's a parable in Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 13 and 40, Jesus gives a parable again. And this parable is a kingdom parable again. He's talking about his kingdom and his kingdom work and how his servants should be serving him. And in that parable, there were three servants that received different amounts and they invested that amount differently. There was a master that came through. He came from a far country. And what happens is this master comes from a far country and he finds uh, one servant. And he says, servant, i tell you what I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you two talents. That's like money. He gives him two coins or two talents. And, uh, or excuse me, he gives him five talents. He gives him five. He goes to another one and he finds another servant. And to this servant, he only gives this servant two talents, two coins. According to his ability. He probably said, this sugar here, he looks pretty smart. He's slick. He, let me give him five so he can give me a good return on my investment. This one, uh, he looked about like, uh, he probably looked about like, uh, he probably looked like me. He looked at me and he said, uh, this fella here, he, he ain't too smart, but he probably give me a good effort anyway. I'm going to give him two talents. And then he looked over there and he found one more guy and he said, I'm going to give you one talent. He knew he didn't have much, uh, maybe didn't have quite as much giftedness or ability, but he gave him one. Well, the one that he gave five talents, you want to know what happened? He took, he took it and he invested it. The master goes away on a long journey, but he's a coming back and he's going to want to see what these guys have invested. Well, he finally comes back a lot of years later and he comes back and he looks at the one that gave five and the one that gave five, he's a smile and he said, he said, master, you gave me five, I invested it and I returned you five more. I got double the investment. I gave you back 10 talents. He looked over here and he examined the second servant. He said, all right, a long time ago I gave you two talents. What would you do with it? He said, Master, boy, I tell you what, I got, hey, I doubled my investment. I got four now. I took my two and I invested it and I gave four. Then he looked over there at Kyle. I, I mean, uh, uh, one of y'all sinners out here. He looked over there and he had the one that had one. You know what that one did? He said, Master, I knew you was a hard master. I knew you whipped me good if I didn't have the money you gave me back. I had no willingness to use my gifts and get up and invest and do something with it. So what I did, I hid it in the dirt. And now, you know what I got? I only got what you gave me. No investment, no return with it. And he looked at that servant with one and he said, you know what? You're a slothful and you're a sorry servant. And you know what happened with that servant? He was cashed in the outer darkness in the gnashing of teeth. Why? Because he was not a good steward with what God had gave him. I want to tell you, there's a lot of people that have been gifted in this world that will not receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. God has gifted them with, with, with charisma. He's given them good personalities. He's made them good businessmen. He has gave them all kinds of gifts and speaking abilities. But you know what they do with the talent that God has given them? They waste it on themselves and they waste it in the world. And when Jesus Christ comes back one of these days and he comes to give an account of of mankind, there's going to be those that had been giving talents by God, but they never used it and they never received the gospel of Christ and used it for him. And they're going to be cast out into outer darkness. But then there's going to be those who have invested in God deeply. And those servants at the judgment seat of Christ, what are they going to do? They're going to say, yes, Lord, I've done all I could do for you. Here, here's, here's what I've got for you. 
God, I led one to salvation. I led 50 to salvation. I led 100 to salvation. I led 20 to salvation. I was faithful to the house of God. I taught Sunday school. I, I, I did everything that I could for you, Lord. You are, you are expected to sow accordingly to your ability. Here in that parable, the one that had five, he didn't hold him to a higher standard because he had five talents. And then he looked at the one with two and say, you should have done what the five talent got. No, he said, within your ability, you did exactly what you could do. Within your ability, you did exactly what you could do. And the third, within your ability, you didn't do one thing that you could have done. Do you see today, the good thing is that you don't have to be Preacher Kyle. And I don't have to be you. And you don't have to try to be Mr. Don. And Mr. Don don't have to try. And there's not a competition for us all to do better than one than the other. But it's within what God has given us to do to be as beneficial and efficient with investing into the kingdom of God as we can. And God's going to look at you one day and because you weren't a Billy Graham or, or you weren't one of these big guys that touch billions or millions, I'm telling you what, there's some of these old faithful grandmas and grandpas that have been on their knees in the middle of the night praying for babies and praying for grandbabies and praying for the church that maybe they weren't out in the limelight, but one day they're going to say and God's going to say, you've been just as faithful as you could be. Come on into my house. You are faithful with little things. I'm going to be, make you faithful and leader over many things. We're only expected to sow accordingly, according to our ability. Now, you need to stretch everything you can within yourself to accomplish that. But I'm thankful. I don't have to try to be Billy Graham because I'm way behind on the ball right now. It'd be a long way to make it there in what little bit of time I've got left. But thank God, God's looking at me for what he's given me to do. And I can be content when I'm doing what he has given me to do. We're looking to see, well, you will only harvest the seed you have sown. You will only harvest the amount you have sown. You are expected to sow accordingly to your ability. Look at verse, uh, the fourth uh, sub-point here. You are expected to sow according to the time you have. You are only expected to sow according to the time that you have. Are you with me out there? There's another parable that I think of when I think about the time that you have. It's in Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. In Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16, Jesus gives another story. He gives another parable. And in that, he is talking about investing and receiving again. And in Matthew 20, verses 1 through 16 in this parable, there are servants again. And these servants are, uh, a master comes out and he's looking for somebody to help him. Say amen. Y'all remember them days way back in the old days? We used to farm biker. And what you did is you went and rounded up you some help for the biker. And a lot of times in the old, old days, that's a little bit before my time, people would go down to Georgetown and they'd round up help and they'd round up as much as they needed. All of them jump in the back of the truck and hey, they'd take off. If you needed 20 head or 30 head, you tried to find everything you could. Because you knew if you needed 30 and you didn't get but 20, somebody going to be working overtime that day, right? But here there's a master that comes in and what he does is he hires one first thing in the morning. He says, I'm going to pay you one cent to help me all day. They say, yeah, that sounds good to me. They jump in the back of the truck. He goes, drops them off at the field. He comes back a couple hours later back to town and he says, I'm looking for help. And the guy says, I'll help you. He said, I'll pay you one cent to help me for the rest of the half of the day. Yeah, I'll do that. Great. Goes out, drops them in the field. Old boys in the field get to talking a little bit. They up there working, doing their servanthood. They get to talking. You know, all the servants get to talking about the raises at the end of the year, right? And they finally tell it for it. So, how much you get? How much you get? How much you get? I want to see if the boss man was just to him. He says, well, we just got here at lunchtime, but I tell you what, he's going to give us one penny. What? You lying. He didn't give you one penny. He gave us one penny. We started, we started 7 o'clock this morning. They get kind of grouchy. He goes back to town at last hour. And he gets with another servant. And he says, I'll pay you one, one cent to come and help me the rest of the day. He comes in. He drops him off in the field. And you know what happens? First man that started that morning, he's mad already. He's grumpy. He's mad as fire. Barely cropping his backer, if you crop him backer or picking cup. Whatever you want to talk call they were doing. Second one, he's happy. He said, boy, I got over on him. I'm, I'm getting just as much as him for half a day. They, he drops him off at the field, the last guy. They get to working there and cropping and looking. You know what he says? Hey, how much you getting paid? Oh, I'm getting one cent for this last little bit of the day. Huh? Man from lunch, he's mad now. What? Really? 
I was like that one time when I started something for utilities years ago. That was 20, roughly 24 years ago. They were bringing in CDL drivers at $10 an hour. Bringing them in at $10 an hour. I'd been there for several months working. And I went and I got my CDLs. I studied hard and I got them the first time I tried them. Some of y'all can't say that. I ain't going to call no names. I come walking up, boy, I, I, was, I was smiling bigger than anything you ever seen in your life. And I walked out in my chest boat, out my big boss man there, and I said, yeah, I'll pass. Give me my raise. Jerker gave me 50 cent, $8.50. He's starting men off coming in the door at $10 an hour. Boy, did he, did he do me wrong? But I signed up for it, didn't I? What am I telling you today is that I think the principle that we see through this is that you're expected to sow according to the time that you have. Some of us were saved when we were 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, go on with it. And there is more expected of them to serve longer and to actually do more before it's over with. But some got saved when they were 30 or 40. Some got saved when they're 50 or 90. But here's the expectation. is God's not expecting you to try to catch up for what you missed. He's just expecting you to be faithful with what you got left. Say amen right there. Amen. And you know, there's some that are going to die early deaths. Boy, I hope it's none of us. We all want to go to about 120, right? Hey, we're good help, not bad help, right? But there's going to be some that are going to die earlier than others. Some great servants, Charles Spurgeon, one of the greatest preachers they say ever was, died in his middle 50s. What? He's talked about way more than I am. I'm almost there. But there's been preachers that have lived to there were 90 didn't do as much as what Charles Spurgeon did. And then there are some people that are going to die in 60 and some 70. Some's going to make it made of 90 or 100. But here's the thing. God just expects you to be faithful with what you've got. He doesn't expect you to do the work of 100 years in 50. Just be faithful with God, what God's given you to do. But in being investing and doing what you can do. I, I'm, I'm sad to say that most of the Christians that I know aren't meeting the expectations of what God has given them to do. You're expected so according to the time that you have. Next, you will be rewarded according to the way you sow. You'll be rewarded according to the way that you sow. The way that you sow. How you represent the Lord. All of us want reward. Say amen right there. Boy, I want reward. I want reward I didn't work for. I'm just going to be honest about it. Lord, give me Billy Graham's reward. Give me these great advantages. But Lord, pour it out on me. But when it comes down to that evil reward, I say, Lord, get it off of me. Don't, 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 don't give me that. In Luke chapter 12, I'll read it to you. Luke chapter 12, verse 42 through 48. We think in this thought, uh, you will be rewarded according to the way you sow. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that because you're out there telling people uh, that you're going to actually get a re reward. You see, some people are just pious Christians. Walk around with the nose up high, better than everybody else. Ain't living like they should be. They telling somebody about Jesus and then at the water cooler, and next thing you know, they're out there on the job cussing like everybody else. Talking about what they did last night. You see, that's not true and genuine service. You're going, to be, you're going to be rewarded according to the way that you sowed along the way. In uh, Luke.